everyone, and welcome to episode 181 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and this week we got the whole crew here. Richard, how you doing today? Good to see you. Hey, Seth, what's going on? Uh, not much. Excited to talk some more magic. And, of course, Chris Van Meter. How you doing today, Chris? I'm doing great. How's everybody else? Uh, doing well, doing well. And also, something new this week, which I'm pretty excited about. We actually have a sponsor for today's podcast. And our sponsor is Spikes Academy, which, if you're not familiar with it, it's pretty sweet. It is a new e-learning academy specifically for Magic the Gathering. Online courses by some of the best players in Magic's history, like Hall of Famer, Paula Vitor, Dama da Rosa, PVDDR. So uh, make sure to check out SpikesAcademy.com and you can get 10% off if you use our coupon code GOLDFISH. So pretty cool to actually have a sponsor for the podcast. Anyway... As far as topics today, we got a few different things to talk about. So we finally got M19 in standard. We had like a weird team tournament, but still, we're going to talk a little bit about what standard is looking like now that we have the core set in the format. We got some commander news, commander 2018, no actual cards, but we got some themes of the four decks that are coming out next month. So we're going to talk about that, some magic arena updates with M19 and some other stuff, and of course, fish mail. So let's just jump right into it starting off with probably our biggest topic which is standard so we had our first week of m19 standard did the either of you get to catch any of it or look over the deck list and if so what is your kind of first take on m19 standard all right i am looking so we had two tournaments we had the team tournament uh which is a team tournament so you have teammates playing modern and legacy so the results there aren't as uh indicative uh but the the deck that won that was uh, our favorite, Red Black Aggro. Uh, if you look at the standard classic from Star City Games, uh, we we have a spread of decks. Uh, Mono Green Aggro won the tournament in the hands of Brandon Dempsey. Uh, in the top 16, you have a bunch of Red Black Aggro lists, uh, Grixis lists, some with Bolas, some without Bolas. Uh, White Black Knights, uh, a Grixis Dragons list, and Red Green Monsters. That's pretty much it. Uh, No zombies. I'm disappointed. I didn't see any zombies in here. Uh, But it looks like nothing too dramatic. I think Nicol Bolas is making his presence felt with all the Grixis lists. And uh, all the other lists kind of just got small upgrades with some of the new cards. Yeah, what do you think, Chris? So, I... I've actually been playing a decent amount of Standard on Magic Online with M19, um, because when I first saw like the idea for the Mono Green list um, from Andrew Jessup's uh, SCG article, I was like, yo, this Atlanta Royal deck this looks awesome, let's start playing it. The deck itself is great. Um, I feel like we're still going to see people just playing Red Black Aggro, because it was like the default best deck from the last format, and like you don't have to change anything for it the deck is still just good um but like i think that it's slowly going to start seeing less and less play as people start experimenting and playing with some of these other these other decks like the the grixis decks with nico bolas i think that there's so much variation and how you can build it that people haven't just kind of figured out what the the perfect formula is for the nico bolas deck at some point that will be figured out and then that's going to be cool. But the the big sleeper right now, I think, is this mono green aggro deck. Like, it's not getting enough credit, and there are so many decks that just actually can't beat the card Vine Mare. So Andrew, <laughs> Andrew Jessup had four Vine Mare in his sideboard, but Dempsey just put them in the main, and from, like, I've been playing the deck a bunch on Magic Online, not only is Vine Mare just, like, almost impossible for any of these um, like control based decks or Scarab God decks to beat. But Vivian Reed is also just like an insane card, way underpriced for its power level, and I'm excited to just keep playing both of those two cards. 
Yeah, that does look like a really cool list. I did not really think of Vinemare as being a constructed staple, but apparently that's the world we're in. It gets this weird value. You mentioned, like, Scarab God, but with even, like, the tokens that you get back, there's a lot of, like, randomly black things coming back from Graveyard, so it's uh, more unblockable than it would be in a lot of standards, so that's definitely a cool list. I think for me, the biggest takeaway was what wasn't dominant, and we mentioned, like, Red Black Aggro still around, still a relatively big part of the meta, but Control didn't have a very good weekend, and maybe that's just week one, Control takes longer to build, all the stuff you hear every set release, but at the at the SCG Classic, there was really not much Control at all. I guess a Grixis Control list and one Esper Control list slipped in, but I think there was, unless I'm missing something, like one or two Teferi decks in the whole top 16, so I think that's encouraging because that was along with mono red the other card slash deck that people were really concerned about being maybe too good for standard so seeing a, a pretty diverse format at least for week one is pretty exciting obviously m19 itself wasn't dominant we saw the vine mare deck we saw a decent amount of nicole boluses showing up in a kind of a variety of builds really from control to mid-range to almost like aggro-ish decks with chain whirlers curving into nicole bolas what other m19 takeaways are there did you notice any other m19 cards kind of having a good weekend or at least showing up on week one yeah let's talk about so vine mare if uh our listeners aren't don't remember their spoiler season. It was a four mana five three hexproof that can't be blocked by black creatures. So that gets through Scarab God, you know, zombies that Scarab God returns and things like that. Uh, also in that mono green aggro list, uh, like CVM said, we have Vivian Reed in the board. Also Thorn Lieutenant. That's the two mana two three. Uh, when it becomes a target of spell or ability, uh, you get a one one green elf token. And for six mana, it gets plus four, plus four. Uh, Nicol Bolas, we all know and love, has been in the Grixis mid-range decks. Uh, a Sarkin list. Remember Sarkin, our our planeswalker. Uh, if you just ramp him into Nicol Bolas, it's a it's a big deal. And that Dragon's list, uh, I saw it on Magic Online a bit. Uh, there is one in eleventh place. Basically, you have some Sarkins. Uh, you have Glory Bringers, you have Nicol Bolas, and you have Demanding Dragon, which is a 5-mana five 5-5 five, five flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, an opponent sacrifices a creature or takes 5 damage. And I think the other new card we saw was Ajani in White Black Knights. Uh, so Ajani can return creatures with converted mana cost 2 or less, so you basically return your knights uh, to the battlefield, and then you go off with History of Benalia. So that list is actually running three uh, new Ajani's, one Karn, and one Gideon. I think those are all the new M19 cards we saw. Any any other cards you guys uh, see in these lists? Well, the, the one thing that is striking me as really interesting with M19 is that um, it's not a set full of cards that are going to augment existing decks. Like This, this set is just full of a bunch of build-around me's which at the very end of an eight set standard, I think it's going to be very difficult for those types of uh, cards to make big splashes unless something that's obviously busted like, like Vine Mare, I think. Um, I would really expect when the rotation happens, Guilds of Ravnica comes out and Amonkhet leaves and Kaladish Block leaves, that we start seeing a lot of decks built around these cards in... M19, things like Sarkin, things like Ajani, things like Liliana. Like these cards are all super like heavy build around me cards, but I don't think it's worth trying to shake, you know, shake up the boat with eight sets right now. But when we jump back down to five, I think they're gonna be very powerful cards and very prevalent cards. Yeah, I think that is that is a really good point. And really, historically, it's pretty rare for the last set of a standard format to really shake up the format too much. Like, uh, we just know what the good decks and good cards are because we've been playing them for so long. But M19 and even, like, Dominaria, too, will get a big boost to power once we hit rotation in a few months. So I think, for me, the other thing that was kind of missing was zombies. I was on the zombie hype train. I saw lots of articles. I've been playing it, and 
and et cetera, et cetera. And it showed up on camera early in the day uh, at the team event, but it didn't make it into the top 16s, didn't really show up anywhere. So what do you all think about uh, zombies, I guess, is the deck that sticks out the most, but the other kind of like hyped decks or cards from M19 that aren't showing up. Is that just a, a wait till rotation type thing? Is there still a chance? I mean, we got a pro tour in a couple of weeks. Uh, is it going to take a little while for some of those uh, themes and decks to develop? So what do you think about the stuff that was missing this weekend? Yeah, I mean, we just had two tournaments and then one of them was a, a tournament on the smaller side, but it was a team event. So small sample size, so we don't know. And typically the pro tour is where things shake up, but we have a different Pro Tour this time, so it's going to be slightly different. Uh, but we, we still, you know, M19 just released. It's too early to call anything. I, I still think uh, we're going to see some new decks, and uh, people like me will try zombies and force zombies, so you, you will see it show up, even if it's not particularly good. I think we'll see it uh, over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think Magic Online is where the majority of that work is going to get put in, and once a uh kind of the, the formula gets solved there, then we'll start seeing it at the larger tournaments. The issue that I think that uh, the Zombies deck is currently having is there's just like this split identity and there's a bunch of cards that people aren't sure which are the best. So whether it's mono black or black white, do you play Scrap Heap Scrounger or not? Um, like how far in do you go on all of the Lords? Um, how many of the Liliana do you play? What does the top end look like? So I think that this is all stuff that just kind of needs to be solved before the deck can have a big breakthrough. But one of the things to keep in mind is that um, in like testing and preparing the mono green deck, uh, Jessup has stated on multiple occasions that Zombies is like the deck's worst matchup. Um, and if it gets to a point where the Zombies deck is popular, that mono green deck uh, either needs to adapt or just be done. Because um, it's very difficult to beat the card Death Baron because it gives all of the Zombies Death Touch and you're not really interacting very much with your opponent. You're just hoping to out-beef them and Death Touch kind of stops that. So like if this mono green aggro deck keeps picking up steam and continues to get better and better... Um, I mean, there's a chance for zombies to kind of swoop in and knock it down off its throne. Oh, interesting. I had not considered that. That is, uh, I think we still have a ways to go. Like, some of the M19 stuff, as CVM mentioned, is, like, build-around type stuff, and it takes longer to figure that out. There is a lot of moving pieces, a lot of options, so it's gonna take a bit to figure out some of the new themes. I think Dragons with Sarkin is kind of similar. Like, there's a lot of power there, but figuring out exactly the numbers, uh, how aggressive are you? We've seen, like, Red Aggro playing Nicole Bolas. Are you trying to to be aggressive with dragons on your top end or more like a mid-range or even control style dragon deck. So I think we'll see some new stuff develop. And that kind of leads me to my last question about M19 for both of you before we move on. So I mentioned a minute ago, Pro Tour in, I think, two weeks, three weeks, the first weekend in August, whatever that adds up to. So looking at these results, how similar do you think the Pro Tour will be? Do you think things will change significantly in those three weeks or... Is it going to be control, mono, red, and kind of the smattering of stuff we saw this weekend? Uh, it'll probably be different. Because like CVM said, we've only had, I think, one uh, league of Magic Online published. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see more and more decks. And as people acquire new cards, uh, they'll, they'll play new decks. So I think it will be different. I, I don't... I don't think that red black aggro will be so dominant that we won't see uh, you know different decks come pro tour time. So I think that because of the team nature of the pro tour, there's going to be significantly less minds being put to work on trying to break the standard format, and I really would not be surprised if we see just a bunch of red black decks and decks tuned to beat red black, because that's kind of the easy default um, thing going into this, and I feel like with the bannings that happened to Legacy and with how kind of variable modern is, that it might be more worthwhile to spend time focusing on those formats than getting everybody looking at standard. I mean, that that does make a lot of sense. Like, you know you can play red-black and it's going to be good in standard, but you might not know with Legacy bannings and modern having 50 decks, like, what the right direction to go is. So that's, that is a really interesting point. I think regardless, it's going to be a great pro tour because... Uh, the, the upside of this team pro tour is if it is 50% red black aggro, they can just focus on new legacy decks in an unbanned format or focus on crazy modern matchups that show up. So it should be a very entertaining pro tour, almost 
regardless of what the standard metagame ends up looking like. Uh, what, if it, what if it's the worst case scenario where all modern decks are KCI and all legacy decks are like Dredge or something? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm most I, likely I, I, not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, I, I would not count that out. That certainly is a possibility. Uh, I'm very worried about KCI in modern in this Pro Tour. Because I feel like the thing that holds KCI back is it's very difficult to play. But these are the best players in the world. So if any of them are going to be able to become proficient with KCI, uh, it's probably that. It also is like similar to uh, like the second Sunrise Eggs deck where it's like very difficult to play kind of overpowered but like still okay like within the realm of the format but it's just like a miserable watching and play experience and if they're and if the pro tour can highlight it then we might actually just end up seeing ironworks get banned yeah i'm i'm down it, it is just not it is not an enjoyable deck it is it is just not fun to really play against or whenever i see my opponent lead on like dark steel citadel into whatever random kci piece i just I'm like, oh my god, really? Should I just scoop now? Like, sure, maybe I'll win, but is is winning worth me sitting through this matchup against KCI? I'm not 100% sure. All right, we, we need once and for all the most miserable deck showdown. What would you rather watch, Lantern Control or KCI? K- KCI, hands down. You would watch, or which one's worse? <laughs> oh, which one's worse? Lantern is way worse. Like, I, I would rather watch KCI than Lantern. Because at least KCI, like has a game plan to, to win the game. Like, Lantern's game plan is to just, like, make you not win the game, which is a way, di- <laughs> a way different watching experience. It's more miserable. So I'm actually the opposite. I, while I'm a little tired of it now, I actually found the Lantern deck to be really interesting just because it was so unique. While KCI, it's very similar to Eggs, and it's actually very similar to, like, Storm or any big turn combo deck, like, oh, you got your Pass in Flame, you cast it, you win the game, oh, you cast your KCI, you win the game. So I think that for me, uh, the Lantern matchup is actually more interesting to watch. Yeah, I actually like watching Lantern because I can follow along and understand what they're doing, whereas <laughs> with these combo decks, I'm like, I, I don't know, he's doing stuff, he probably <laughs> has something in mind, but I don't know what it is. So I actually like Lantern, I'm like, oh, he needs a steering bridge right now or he's dead. Okay, he got it. Now he's going to build for the next 20 minutes. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, I guess the good news is the current builds of KCI are less miserable than the original Eggs deck. Uh, at least people, like, once you see a couple of specific cards, you can uh, kind of just scoop against KCI. You see a Scrap Trawler with the Mirror Retriever, you're like, all right, if I don't, if I can't interact with this, this is infinite, it wins the game. The original Eggs deck, there was always like this, oh my god, they could fizzle. They could fizzle. Yeah, like, sure, they're drawing 10 cards, but what if they cast a second Sunrise and then they end up whiffing? Like, I have this p- small percentage chance. So you kind of had to wait it out in hopes of hitting, like, that one percenter so i actually think the new builds are less miserable but they're still they're still miserable so before we move on from standard one thing i do wanted to point out is there was a red green monsters deck uh that matt tumovich top eight of the classic with uh that just has a few new cards in it namely vine mare and vivian reed in the sideboard um but uh this is like you know one of the few decks that takes advantage of having both a one mana accelerant with land war elves and a two mana accelerant with servant of the conduit to get to those planeswalkers and vine mare type cards very quickly. I could easily see vine mare just like switching to be a four of in the main of this deck because it's just so unbeatable by a lot of the decks that aren't trying to like gum, gum up the ground with non black creatures. Um, and it has Banefire, which I think is going to end up being a huge trump card against the control decks. It's always something to keep in mind. I think Banefire is a card that people will forget until they get hit by seven and die. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is that is a coolest as well. I've been messing around with something similar with Sarkin's Unsealing, playing that, and then playing like Glorybringer. Oh, it's it is uh, pretty sweet, pretty sweet. Yeah. All right, so let's move on from the world of standard at M nineteen to the world of supplemental products. So we had a couple of days ago a preview stream talking about the archetypes slash decks of Commander twenty eighteen. So. Richard, why don't you fill us in on what we do know, the little bit we do know about C2018. All right. Uh, No spoilers. Spoilers start July 23rd. So what we did get were the four decks. So there's four decks this time, and they each have their own theme. So there's no unifying theme across the decks. They're just four random commander decks they decided to put together. We have... 
Is It Artifacts called Exquisite Invention. We have Jund Lands called Nature's Vengeance. Bands Enchantments called Adaptive Enchantments. And Esper Top of Library Matters called Subjective Reality. And along with these four decks, they gave us some concept art, which I'm going to attempt to explain to our audio listeners. Oh, uh, there is <laughs> there is like a knight with like a lion helmet on a horse charging. That's that's picture one. Picture two is some kind of spider. Picture three, I feel like we should know this character. It's a monk, a female monk, and there are a whole bunch of masks floating around her and she's like holding one in her hand. Picture four, I believe, is a Karametra looking. It looks like a Greek goddess with like a picture uh, with water in a field. Uh, the next creature, uh, the next picture is a creepy child in a swamp uh, with <laughs> butterflies. It's uh, it's it's quite the picture. And then the last one is some generic Innistrad looking uh, zombies coming up. It's Gravecrawler. Grave. It's Gravecrawler. Is it actually Gravecrawler? It look. I mean, it's it's literally crawling out of the grave. So. <laughs> So that's that's our art. I don't know what you can make from that. Aside from, I guess, that Karametra looking person looks pretty Karametra ish, and there's an enchantments deck. Yeah, I I couldn't really take much away from the artwork without any spoilers or anything. It was pretty difficult to really make heads or tails of it. So what do you think? Uh, discounting the art for the time being, what do you think of these themes? So. Uh, is it artifacts? Jun lands, Bant enchantress, and Esper top your top of your deck matters. So, what do you think of the themes? Good choices, bad choices. Which one are you most looking forward to? Least looking forward to? Uh, CVM. What do you think? Uh, so I'm, I like the themes. Um, I think that they are like the top of library matters is really the only one to me that feels unique. Um, but I guess that's fine. Uh, I'm super excited for the the lands deck uh, out of Jund. Uh, because I feel like it's going to have Gitrog Monster in there somewhere, and that is like one of my favorite commander cards. Yeah, Gitrog, Gitrog is sweet. I think that's actually for me the two decks I'm most excited for. The Jun Lands, just because I think that actually sounds fairly unique. We've seen that theme develop with like Splendid Reclamation, World Shaper, Gitrog Monster, Ramanab Excavator. We just had uh, Crucible Worlds reprinted, so we've seen kind of this theme in those colors recently. But I think it'll be a pretty cool deck, and I'm very interested just to see what Top of the Library matters actually means. Like, what is what is this archetype? What is it going to look like? What kind of cards? It seems like there could be some really cool, unique cards that would show up in that deck. But what do you think, Richard? Oh, what was that mechanic? Clash? Where you reveal oh. the top? I, like, I think that's it's going to be, like, divining tops. Uh, maybe, like, totally lost type cards. And then my guess it's something where everyone flips the top of their library and then some condition happens. Uh, kind of like... Um, Vevictus, like those type of cards would be top of library. What I'm interested in is what the commander would actually do for this, because we we had we've had top of library cards before, but we don't really have a strong theme or mechanic around it. So this time we're gonna have a commander that's gonna do something, and I hope it's just beyond divining top on a commander. I hope it's actually, <laughs> or you know, Corsair of Crufix commander. Right? I hope it's actually something quite interesting that requires you to manipulate your library. But that also means there's probably a lot of shuffling for this deck. <laughs> I, I could see it being something where, like, all players play with the top of their library revealed. And, like, if some condition is met, then this thing happens, like, on a phase or every turn. So it's like, you know, if, if you would draw a card, if the top of your library, you know, is, cost, is the highest mana cost, then you would draw two cards instead or just, like, something weird like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of hoping it's just like Commander Lantern Control. <laughs> like seeing, oh no! Oh, just no. like the most miserable prison deck, Ooh. all the mill artifacts. It it could be it could be uh so everybody plays to the top card of their library revealed, and players can only play uh, spells if they share a card type with the card that's on top of their library. Ooh, Ooh. that would that would be interesting. That is very interesting, but sets just basic. I mean, this basically incentivizes you to play Lantern Control <laughs> because the top of the library matters. You need to play Lantern. <laughs> so, what do you think of uh, blue red artifacts? It feels like this is a 
well that Wizards goes to often. I think we we had the Brea deck, which was, yes, multicolor, but still, we've had it as a theme in multiple standard sets. I like it. I, I like artifact theme commander decks, but I'm a little bit like uh, again, like how about something different for is it? Yeah, I don't I don't I don't like artifact themes because it seems like red only gets artifact themes and we've had enough of them. I I would have rather seen like a chaos deck or I don't know, just basically anything but artifacts because when you sit down to build a red deck, you're pretty much priced into, you know, artifacts, uh, chaos, and, like, burn, like, like kind of aggro-y type things. So I, I wanted to see more themes that Red can get involved in. Yeah, the well, that is a well that they go back to pretty often. Like, when you're looking at blue and red, that well is pretty shallow. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of different themes that you can do with that color combination. And I think the artifacts is just kind of, like, just a good general theme, especially since like a lot of the cards that you would get out of that deck anyway, you could just put into your other commander decks. So it makes it like way easier to sell if it's something general like artifacts as opposed to zoomed in on like a chaos type theme. I think it's also interesting if you look at the core set, uh, Blue Red Artifacts was a theme there. We also had a new uh, Enchantress, a Seder Enchanter, I think it is, uh, mm-hmm. in the color. So we can kind of see the foreshadowing, and I got to give Wizards a lot of credit. And we also have uh, also uh, cards from last year's Commander set with like some new cats and some stuff on theme from the tribes for last year. So I feel like in the last two years, really, Wizards has done a really good job of like integrating the Commander decks in with the standard products and making it so, oh, if you bought a booster box of M19, you're going to be able to use some of those cards to update one of these commander decks. And we'll probably see that trend continue. I wouldn't be surprised if, kind of like the Jun Lan themes is maybe somehow related to Golgari in Guilds of Ravnica this fall. So I think they've done a really good job of having this flow between standard sets and commander decks over the last couple years. Uh, What do you guys think about the lands deck? Do you think so when I when I see lands, I think like legacy lands, but I doubt that will be what this is. Like I don't do you think it's gonna be a bunch of kind of like utility lands, or do you think it's gonna be like a landfall type deck where you're you really have like Titania and cards like that, where it focuses on creatures instead of the actual lands? I think personally, my guess would be that the lands themselves are not the calling card, but instead it's going to be uh, Titania, Gitrog Monster, Ramanam Excavators. I think it's going to be moving lands in and out of your graveyard for value. That's my guess. Yeah, I could see that. And it also is a good place to reprint something like, like Dark Depths could be in it. We could get like some, some more cool, like a, a cool art crop rotation. Um, you know, they, they could have, like, some new, cool, non-basic lands that they could print to put in it. Um, maybe some type of unique color-fixing land. Um, I think it's more so that it just gives them the opportunity to do a lot of cool stuff if the deck has the lands to, uh, stapled to it. Do you think Do you think we will get... Last, uh, last question before we move on. Do you think we will get the enemy colors of the lands from Battle Bond? Because I think you could fit all the enemy color lands into these decks if you wanted to. Already? Yes. Oh, they're so good for Commander. I, I They feel like me like they can be the, the new Soul Ring, where just every year they are pumping out these lands in the Commander deck, so everyone has at least one good land for their mana base. I don't know that you need to. I think it's too close. Like, I don't know that they want to cannibalize their sales of Battle Bond, because the lands are a big draw of that set. So I, I think while they could, I think it's probably too early. It'll most likely be in next year's product. All right, so let's move on from Commander to the world of digital magic in MTG Arena. Got some updates, M19 update. I think there's a few pieces of big news. Uh, Richard, why don't you fill us in on kind of our headings under the Magic Arena category? All right, so they, they finally pushed out the M19 update. So uh, the big thing is M19 is available on Arena. Uh, So right now, competitive drafts and also for standard play. So with this update, they they gave us a few things. I think big was uh, localization. So if you speak non-English languages, you might have support for your language now. Uh, Also with this, they added the new player experience, which is a tutorial for new players. It feels like very Hearthstone 
single player mission like where you have two NPCs and or you have an NPC versus you and there's banter going on between your characters and they tell you hey you should attack now and oh you should block and when you block this happens so they teach you the mechanics of the game there uh, and uh, with that you get you you start with a new deck and uh, as you finish the tutorial they give you a bunch of free decks and they give you quests for two color decks and in these decks there are some exclusive cards to Magic Arena that are legal to play in the standard format on Magic Arena. But, but they're real bad. They are. So <laughs> for an idea of what these cards are, there's a five mana that when you are, five mana instant when you are attacked, create three one one spirit tokens. Uh, Angelic Reward is a five mana enchantment where enchanted creature gets plus three, plus three and flying. Spiritual Garden is actually a portal card. It's a 5-mana 3-4. When it enters a battlefield, you gain 4 life. Inspiring Commander, which is probably the best of these cards, is actually marked as a rare. 6-mana 1-4. When another creature enters with power 2 or less under your control, gain a life and draw a card. And Tactical Advantage, a single white for target blocking or blocked creature. You control gets plus 2, plus 2. So, a bunch of cards. Legal for standard, but arena exclusive. And then there's a couple other things. There's deck strength matchmaking. So when you play ladder now, uh, you have an MMR, which is an uh, internal rating of your skill, but you're also matched based on your deck strength. And the way they calculate this is how many of the cards in your deck, uh, how many of them are popularly used as wild cards to create other decks. So what that means is if your, your deck is full of tier one staples, it has a, a higher power than a deck that doesn't have staples. And that's supposed to factor in your matchmaking. And the idea is if you're playing some janky brew, you're only matched up against janky brews. Uh, so that's what they're trying to go for for their ladder play. And last thing is there's a bunch of Brewers Delight events where they recognize it's hard to get cards like rares and mythics uh, that that are not tier one, but you don't want to waste your wild cards on them. So they've added these events where you can earn some of these cards, uh, their themed cards, like you can earn some rare cats or things like that by entering these events. So ways to get rares and mythics that uh, are not, you know, through your wild cards. So, so yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff there. So M19 being on arena is cool. Good, good job, wizards. Oh wait, asterisk, <laughs> asterisk. So only competitive draft for the next two weeks, meaning you have to pay fifteen hundred gems to play best of threes. The quick, uh, the quick match drafts, which you can pay a thousand gold, don't start till uh, two weeks from now, I think. So it's probably also worth mentioning that the actual release of M nineteen was a bit of a disaster. They had some problems with the patch. I think even today still, I believe the new player experience has been taken offline because of issues it was having. There was supposed to be a big streaming event that got canceled because uh, trouble with the patch. So, I, I mean, stuff like that happens in the beta, so not going to be too harsh on that, but it was a, a little bit clunky of a release for M19. I think for me, I strongly dislike the exclusive standard legal card thing. Yes, I know that they're not really standard playable cards, but similarly to the Chinese Planeswalker decks, which I still think should have just been legal everywhere when you're selling them in the U.S., I, I dislike Wizards going down this path. And it seems like at this point, it's been multiple things where they're going down this weird exclusive cards that are legal in weird places. Just had Elian Trazi tweeting about how he won event, uh, a local event at 1K with Nexus of Faith, the Bio Box promo that you can't get out of packs. So I, I don't like this path that we're going down. So are these cards in specific a huge deal? No, probably not. Most likely not. Almost definitely not. But I do really dislike this overall direction that Wizards is going with these exclusive cards. Yeah, I mean, I think that as long as it doesn't become an issue, then it won't be an issue. But we won't know <laughs> if it'll ever be an issue until it does become an issue. So you kind of have to make the decision ahead of time if you're going to do it or if you're not. So it seems like it is something that they're going to keep doing, like this channel-specific cards. As long as they suck, that's fine. They just need to... Make sure they suck. Oh, see, that's that's the problem, right? Like it's yeah. like the buy a box promos where 
they're like, well, we'll make cards that suck so people don't get mad, but then they don't, you know, achieve their goal of attracting new players, so they have to make them better, and then they're gonna cross the line at some point and make the cards good enough so that it draws you into arena. Because I think that's the only explanation for this. If they're just looking for new player friendly cards, like they have the welcome decks to draw cards from, uh, they have the planeswalker deck to draw cards from, or they can just simply, you know, have you use new cards but don't, you know, start your deck off, you know, in standard with them. There are many ways they could have approached this. So the fact that they decided to make exclusive cards is worrying because I think they'll eventually use it to promote arena as something and the the more they diverge it from regular standard and you know regular f and m and moto play uh I, I it's i think that's like the beginning of the end right like a lot of people didn't like duels of the planeswalker because it was not you know quote unquote real magic it was a different format so if the formats start diverging i think arena's in big trouble yeah I think that one of the things they promise, like going into Arena, is this is going to be real magic. And having, although we're not there yet because these cards are bad, having a different format because different cards are legal, that is, seems like kind of uh, not as directly as like changing the rules of the game, but that's still a way where it's not exactly real magic if you consider paper real magic. And I think the big concern is it's going to be very difficult for wizards to sell competitive players on playing that like if part of their goal is to get moto players to switch over to arena i think it's going to be very challenging if the format isn't exactly the same as standard because you want your gameplay online to be relevant for your fnm or your gp or your pro tour or whatever so to me that's kind of a troubling step i do like the idea of the matchmaking changes i would dislike them if it was for actual tournaments but i think for just playing like the ranked matches i think it's kind of cool to try to uh, match deck strength to some extent because it's not that like you can you can get to the same rank as someone but you can be playing a deck that uh, is a lot different or underpowered compared to your opponent's tier one play mono red every time so i think that's a good attempt at fixing that problem uh, any other thoughts on matchmaking or any of the other arena stuff? Yeah, the matchmaking is strange because it's great if you like to play off-the-cuff decks and don't want to play against tier 1 decks because, uh, you know, when you make, you know, if you don't include Scarab Gods and Chain Rollers in your deck, you'll get matched up with other people that don't have those in your deck, so that's good if you don't want to play against tier 1 decks. However, if you have this weird brew designed to beat you know, mono red and scarab gods and, and vine mares or whatever, uh, if your deck is considered a brew in their system, it might match you up against only brews. So you don't have an outlet to play other tier one decks, even though your deck is like some weird brew. But that is mitigated by the fact that you can just enter normal events. So when you play a normal event, like a constructed event, uh, you're matched by record only. So none of this fancy deck strength matchmaking. So I think it is pretty cool that you have that option now in the ladder, and there's different modes where that doesn't apply, so I think that covers all the bases. So overall, I think it's a pretty good change, as long as they can define bruise correctly and it, it's, you know, it's not too off. Yeah, I like the more that Wizards can experiment in the digital space with the things that they're doing with Arena, I think the better. Because like, there's, there's not going to be a lot of things that they can do with that in terms of actual gameplay because the cards are kind of bound by what they can do in the physical space but any like things that you can do to kind of tweak the system or the program or format design that type of stuff within the digital area area i think that's good and they should keep doing that i almost wish uh, that they had just made arena like uh if we had made Magic in 2018 on a digital platform, this is how we would have done it. I think that would be that would be really interesting to me to have a game that was Magic-ish, because I feel like they're in danger of making Arena not real Magic anyway. And then you might as well just go all the way and make the coolest like Magic game that you can possibly make in the digital space with no regards to the paper game or Magic Online. Yeah, Wizards is too conservative for something like that. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I really wish they would have just made Moto <laughs> in like 2018, but since we're going down this route anyway, I think so far they're doing an okay-ish job. 
I don't know. This this last update, there were so many. There's so many bugs. The game is very slow and buggy. Uh, it's in actual in terms of actual gameplay, it's much. It's like probably the worst it's ever been since uh, since I got the beta a couple months ago at least. It's super slow and buggy, and I've actually filed a bunch of bug reports now because I've run into these really weird edge case bugs where I'm like, uh, they should probably know about this. So, yeah. I. I mean, good news is, it still is the beta, so I would be more worried about that aspect if it was actually, the game was actually released. Hopefully they they will figure that stuff out before we get to the release. Uh, Speaking of the release, uh, do you think it's going to actually happen in 2018? That was... That was their initial goal, at least, that they mentioned in a couple of uh, conference calls and stuff with the CEO. Are you expecting the game to be officially released by the end of the year? Nope. Yeah, I would be very, I would be very surprised. Yeah, I think I'm kind of leaning that way too. That will probably still be in beta, and it might be more next fall's rotation when we actually are ready for a wide release of Arena. Which, I mean, I guess that's fine if you get to the point where it's like an open beta and pretty much everyone can play. Then it's that's still pretty fine anyway. Uh, one other note with uh, these issues: any changes to your thoughts on? on the future of digital magic. Uh, I The more these things happen, the more I become convinced that Wizards really is planning on having Magic Arena and Magic Online run side by side for the foreseeable future. I was very, uh, a year ago or even six months ago, I was a little nervous and skeptical about that, but I really feel like that is their plan now. So any any thoughts on that? What do you think about the future with Modo and Magic Arena? Yeah, I think I echo your sentiment. I, I thought it was just PR talk when they said they, you know, want Arena for new players and Modo for franchise players. But the more they talk, the more I think they're actually serious. And I think it's a really bad idea, by the way, to have your platform split. But I think they're actually serious about it. And I don't know. My, my faith is wavering on their technical implementation. Uh, it their latest release shows that they are not, let's say, you know, they're not technically up to par, I guess, in terms of game making. They're, there's so many problems with their build. It runs so slow on my computer. Like, how am I going to expect this to ever run on a phone? Like, I, I have questions about whether they can actually implement their vision. And then their vision itself, I think, is a bit spotty. So my, my confidence in Arena is a, a little lower now. And my confidence in Magic Online is a little higher now, based on uh, the events over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, I, it does look like that that's going to be the case, and, and I can't say I'm particularly thrilled by it, but I am uh, excited to sit back and watch what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but now we need to pine for a Magic Online update, right? If Arena's not going to replace Magic Online, how do I play full-blown Magic in a client that's not 1995, right? Yeah, well... I don't know. I guess we have to wait for the new version of Microsoft Excel so they can update it all. <laughs> uh, all right. On that note, let's uh, let's do some fish mail. Uh, Richard, take it away. All right. If you have your questions, send them to at mtggoldfish with the hashtag mtgfishmail, and we'll get to your questions on air. Uh, Jay Hoviskas, do you think if Karn was eight converted mana costs, uh, he would still see play in traditional Tron. It would be significantly worse, but I mean, Ugin sees play, so probably, maybe not as a four of, but I think it would still see play. God, the deck would be so different. Like, yeah. I can't, I can't imagine what a Tron deck would be like if Karn didn't cost seven mana. Like, it might just end up being that, like the Eldrazi Tron style is the default. I don't know. Like, the the deck would be way different. It, it might not have even been a deck. Yeah, I, I think you definitely need a 7-drop because you can't assemble Tron and pass the turn. So you would replace Karn with something else and Karn would fit into the Ugin slot. But I don't know what other what other 7-drops there are that, that are actually viable. It'd probably just be like more Worm Coils and like Mirror Battlesphere or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could see Mirror Battlesphere. That, I mean, the thing is, if you cast a 7-drop on, on turn 3... You're probably in good shape. I mean, Karn is the best, but yeah, Mere Battlesphere on turn three is still going to win a lot of games. All right, next question. A little cheeky. Suppose Wizards printed the following. Two and a white Harvest Moon <laughs> enchantment. Basic lands are planes. What do you suppose this card would do to modern? 
So, not Blood Moon. Basic lands become planes, so you're incentivized to play non-basic lands. Ugh. Man. Uh... I would. It would be fun to play with Blood Moon. <laughs> I would probably try it. That's. I don't know. I. I don't like punishing basic lands. Really, it's similar. It reminds me of Choke, except you just like choke out any mono color deck. And I don't think Choke is particularly a healthy card. Yeah, I mean, like, what exactly does that card do? Right. It just. It feels like a a, a, a do nothing card. Like. 10% of the time, you're just going to slam dunk your opponent and they can do nothing, but 90% of the time, it's just a, a bad card in your deck. <laughs> yeah. But I think, would it be better or worse than red. Blood Moon? It's way yeah, worse. I think it'd be way worse than Blood yeah. Moon. <laughs> yeah. Because it only stops, like, really mono color decks, and we don't even have that many in modern. Uh, next question. Snare Johnson 664 Have you guys ever thought about making an Against the Odds play map featuring artwork from some of your favorite Against the Odds decks? Ooh. That'd be a pretty sweet uh, idea. That would be pretty sweet. But would the, I like that idea. Would the play mat just be 34 Siege Rhinos? <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to at least throw in a Panharmonica. <laughs> so, oh, uh, not 34, 68. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not my fault, oh, one. Do you see Wizard Tribal seeing standard success now that it can curve Exclusion Mage into Academy Journey Mage? I've been considering pairing these two with Nabon, Dean of Iteration, just as roadblocks for combo or mill. So I think Wizards might have a shot after rotation, but uh, the thing I found with the Nabon builds is you play a lot of cards that die to Chain Whirler, which is very punishing. So I, I think there's a chance of like an aggressive, more Adlis, prowessy Wizards deck could be pretty good. Yeah, I think the Wizard deck needs another one drop. So like a Monastery Swift Spear power level card. To be to be a, a thing, that would that would go a long way. We we only have Soul Scar Mage. Is there another one drop? Uh, we have Get to Lava Runner. Oh, Soul Lava Runner. Scar Mage is also rotating. So, uh, Ken nine eight seven seven nine three three one. When you're brewing a new deck, how do you know when, uh, or how much to tweak it, or when to cut your losses and scrap the idea? Oh man, that's a really good question, and I don't have a a solid answer. I kind of just go by by feel. Play it a few times, tweak it a few times, uh, but there is a point where eventually I just kind of I don't usually get rid of decks forever, but put it on the shelf for a few weeks or even a few months or until the next set release and then maybe revisit it and see if something's changed as far as card pool or the metagame in the future. I think a lot of it actually comes down to what is your goal for this deck? So if you're trying to like have a meta breaker best deck in the format like it's pretty obvious if it is or if it isn't and if your goal is to try to make that deck and it's not turning out to be that deck then you should stop and move on to something else but if your goal is to just make like a fun competitive deck then it just comes down to you know if you if you're not having fun playing it, then you should probably change something or shelf it and if you can't win a single match and it's not fun to play then you should probably change something or shelf it. So, again, uh, for, for me, it just comes down to what the goal of the deck is. Uh, and the biggest driving factor is fun. Like, if I'm not, not having fun playing this deck when it does what it's supposed to do, then something's not lining up properly. All right. Uh, LJBFGC, it's obvious we won't get Sarah Sanctum reprint in Commander 28 enchantment deck. So what are your thoughts on printing one of the following as a substitute? Growing Rights of Itlamok, but for enchantments. Yeah, I I think that could be a thing that was printed. I don't know if we're gonna have flip cards in in Commander, but I think something similar to that could work. Yeah, flip cards probably hard uh, because they need a special printing process for that. Uh, actually, there's a second option here. We have Magus of the Sanctum. But what, what would Magus of the Sanctum? It's, it's like a it's like an elf that taps based on your uh, gives mana based on the number of enchantments you have. That's weird, though, because Sanctum is white, and having a white mana dork would be very strange. Yeah. And having a green... Uh, maybe you could do it with a green one, I guess. Like, green does care about enchantments. Well, maybe be that a, would be fine. A green... Like, a three-mana green-white mana dork. Yeah. That could that could work. I think I'd rather see a growing rights of Illamok take on it. Or, like, how uh, Cabal Stronghold compares to... Uh, the coffers. original coffers, yes. Uh, so something like that. Maybe like a slightly worse version, but still good enough for most commander decks. 
Yeah, I mean, it it, it, it could even just end up being something um, in between, so where it's just like a Nykthos style deck, where it has a two mana activation, but then you get, you know, green and or white mana for each enchantment you control or something. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, Peter Pascua, do you have a link or source to the best online guide for land categories, like dual lands, battle lands, shock lands, and which lands uh, belong to which category? I get them constantly mixed up. Hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen one of those, but maybe that would be a good thing to have exist. So for EDH, I use Mana Base Crafter, I believe it's called. If you just Google Mana Base Crafter, I believe it comes up. And it basically lets you select your commander or colors, and it shows you all of the lands that you can use to produce those colors, and they're split by their categories. So they first have dual lands, and they have shock lands, but then you know you have like the weird lands, uh, you have scry lands, gain lands, and all the other lands and utility lands that you would never memorize, right? So uh, I would actually check that out. That's a pretty good resource that I use when building my Commander Clash decks. Uh, Next question, Benjamin with I. If you could go back in time and tell yourself some advice when you first started playing Magic, what would you say? Ooh, can we split this into financial advice and non-financial advice? Because <laughs> there's, sure. like everybody's answer is always, go buy Black Lotuses for $100. Like that, <laughs> that, I don't feel like that's the spirit of the question. <laughs> All right, let's split it. Let's split it to financial and non-financial. Yeah, I'd go buy a black lotus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that would be black, one. All the black financial. Lotuses. Um, like, I feel like my advice would be just to like keep doing what I'm doing. Like, I feel like my path in magic has been, um, I don't, I don't think "good's" the right word, but like, I don't think I would change anything. Like, I've had a lot of fun, I met a lot of people, and uh, I really like where I am at with magic, and I really wouldn't change it. Yeah, as far as financial advice, I think I I just wish I had sold less cards. I used to buy and sell cards a lot, and sometimes I look at card prices and I was like, oh my god, if I just, just hold on to all these cards, it would have been so much better. So if you if you ever get to the point where you're thinking about getting out of the game, rather than just like dumping all your cards for bulk prices, just stick them in a closet or something, and maybe 15 years later you're going to be very glad you did. As far as uh, other advice... I don't know. In some ways, I'm kind of like CVM, where I'm pretty happy with how my magic path has turned out, but I guess it took me a long time to figure out how much I like casting Blood Moon, so maybe I would have pushed myself <laughs> towards Blood Moon a little quicker. Fair. Uh, for me, I guess financially, I guess the same sentiment that Seth has, uh, which a lot of people had, was when I stopped playing magic in uh, high school, I sold all my cards for like 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever, and I'm like, yes. Right, and now I regret that immensely because I had who knows how many Force of Wills and Wastelands and stuff, Lion's Eye Diamonds, worthless at the time. So a common piece of advice I see people say is if your collection is not worth that much, then uh, just hold on to it. I mean, if you're not going to play Magic ever again and you want to buy a house and put a down payment down, then by all means sell your collection. But if you just have like 10 bucks worth of cards or something, I, I would just keep it around uh, so that you can just bust it out and play again one day or uh, you never know it might go up in price uh, non-financial advice I don't know play play Jund earlier <laughs> I, I, I was I was a huge like control for I was like the typical spike where I'm like wow aggro is dumb let's play control so I can outsmart everyone and you know after a while I'm like okay control control is dumb I don't want to play control anymore uh, so it turns out I'm better suited, or I like playing mid-range a lot better. So maybe if I discovered that earlier, uh, maybe I'd be on the pro tour. No, uh, maybe I don't know. It, it would be it would be different how I play. I think I think starting off with control uh, made me I don't know made made me play a certain way, play too passively, I guess. So maybe if you started aggro, you'd be a much more aggressive Magic player. It's a good one. All right, last question. John the Mackum. Yeah, the storm ban got me thinking again. Fun is a dangerous thing to talk about. Uh, Boggles, Ad Nauseam, Tron have all been called unfun. Where do we draw the line? What's our opinion on what is fun and what is not fun for 
for modern. I so I say unfun probably more than I should, but when I say it, I'm just talking from my own very subjective uh, perspective. So I think what is fun and what is unfun, I think it's it's a personal thing, and it's up to you. So if you ever hear me say that, just take that as that's my personal feelings about the deck, and they're obviously very biased for a whole bunch of reasons. So, I but I don't think you can just say uh, in black and white that a deck is unfun. Uh, I mean, you can make some generalizations about the average Magic player. Like, I would be willing to bet that the average Magic player thinks getting beat down by Slippery Bogle is unfun. <laughs> that, that, that's, that is, yeah, okay. It, Boggle's exception. That is just, that is unfun. <laughs> I think it has to do with interaction. I think if you can't interact with your regular cards, most people will call it unfun. So, for example, Bogle's, not, none of your spells work because it's X-proof. Or if we're talking about Storm... Uh, you know, they're just playing all their spells. If you just have removal and creatures, you can't do anything about it. Even if you have a counter spell, that may not be enough because of the storm mechanic. Uh, Tron, they just slap down Tron and exile all your stuff before you get to do anything. Uh, that's why people don't like blood moons. Your lands, your lands don't tap for anything anymore. Or it's snaring bridge, you have all these creatures but you can't attack. So I think that's what people think about in general as unfun. But... That's all relative. I mean, I think people say it's unfun, but they realize that it's fun for the other person, so it's okay. Where I think Wizards draw the line, Wizards draws the line of fun too, right? That's why, like, Eggs got, got the ban, is when there is, when progress is too slow. So, like, dividing top ban, considered, you know, unfun, it just takes too long. Uh, Wizards typically doesn't like fetch lands in standard because it takes too long to shuffle your deck. Uh, and, like, Eggs, it just takes forever. Uh, so in Wizard's mind, I think unfun means, like, just too slow. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's Fun is pretty subjective. Um, interaction is a big part of it. It's the main reason you've seen this de- design philosophy move away from um, counter spells, uh, just more Doom Blades. Also the same, like, I don't know how many of you have, like, read the like the, the stories about specific cards and interactions that Ethan Fleischer has been posting on Twitter. But one really interesting was like they wanted a common white removal spell in the set and it was initially pitched as Divine Verdict but changed to take vengeance because of cards like Herald of the Faith or like you get in these situations where I have this cool creature but um, you know I'm not going to attack because you might have Divine Faith. And then, like, we finally get to this point where I do attack, and then you have the Divine Faith, and I never get to use my cool creature. To where Take Vengeance is, like, more mana efficient, but still allows your opponent to do what they're trying to do, and then you can handle their their threat. So, like, that type of interaction is more along the lines of what Wizards is designing the cards for, um, because that's what they perceive as fun for all parties, not just one. Yeah. Well, that's all our fish mail uh, questions for this week. So thank you to everyone who sent them in. If you have questions in the future, you can send them to the hashtag MDGFishmail on Twitter. And I think that that brings us to the end of episode 181 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So uh, thanks to both of you for hanging out. It's always fun. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks again to SpikesAcademy.com for sponsoring today's show. And uh, yeah, so we will be back next week. The start of course at 2018 spoilers. It'll be day one, so we'll have plenty to talk about. So until then, have a wonderful week, and this is the crew signing out.